Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Nancy Lindborg, and I'm the president of the United States Institute of Peace. We're delighted to have you here today. Uh, USIP is an independent federal institution that was chartered by Congress with the mandate of finding practical solutions for keeping conflict from becoming violent. Uh, we know that conflict is going to happen. It's a natural state of affairs, and it can even, when managed well, be positive or transformative. When it's not managed is when it becomes violent and it under, uh, undermines progress and stability. This underscores the urgency of what USIP does around the world. Um, we are very pleased to welcome, for his second time here, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, as well as a, a warm welcome to his delegation. Many of you have had a chance to visit in the past, and in fact, we've had uh, several of you as speakers, including Minister of Interior uh, Khan, Minister of Finance uh, Dar, Special Assistant, Assistant Fatima, and of course, Ambassador Jalali, Jalani. So we're very pleased to have you here today, and I think uh, uh, this is one of about 70 engagements, speeches, roundtables that we've had over the past several years with Pakistan, which underscores uh, our deep engagement um, and links to the work that we do in country, where we work with a strong network of civil society organizations who are using innovative ways to build peace, to build tolerance, uh, to build new bridges of understanding uh, within Pakistan society. And we also work with the Pakistan government, um, in particular on helping to improve the effectiveness of policing in partnership with the National Police Bureau, working with the Planning Commission on how to incorporate conflict analysis into all of the new development projects. Um, and uh, one of my favorites is working with youth uh, as they promote tolerance. And when I was last there in March, uh, both civil society and government officials alike were really still gripped with the tragedy of the shootings at the Peshawar school children. Um, and I met with a number of civil society activists who were ex increase, increasing their commitment uh, to really build a more peaceful society, including these 60-second film videos where very powerful expressions uh, by an eighth grade girl uh, in one of the videos that I saw uh, it, uh, laying out a powerful vision of a more peaceful Pakistan. We're very pleased to be a part of that effort, and I'm very pleased to welcome the Prime Minister as a part of that conversation. We um, unfortunately will not have time for the moderated dialogue uh, that we had hoped to because of a uh, an accelerated departure time, uh, but I am very pleased to welcome to the stage to introduce the Prime Minister, our board chair, Stephen Hadley. Uh, I think you all are well aware uh, of Stephen Hadley's long tenure as a, a senior statesman in this town. He was a national security advisor uh, for President Bush. He also recently traveled to Pakistan with our team, as well as Afghanistan and India. Please join me in welcoming Steve Hadley to the stage. Good morning. It is indeed an honor to welcome the Prime Minister of Pakistan to this stage uh, once again. He was first here almost exactly two years ago on October 16, 2013, and it's a pleasure to have you back. This is obviously a critical time for peace in South and Central Asian reg Asia region, and this is why this region and peace in this region is one of USIP's highest priority areas of program focus. It is why Nancy Lindbergh's first trip as the new president of USIP was to Pakistan and Afghanistan in March, as she has told you. And I and a USIP team had an opportunity to visit the region again uh, in late July of this year. And I was struck during my visit to Pakistan, Afghanistan, and India just how much has radically changed since I was last in the region about three years ago. Probably the most troubling development is that ISIS, or Daesh, 
has come to the region and its black flag has been raised in parts of both Afghanistan and Pakistan. Second, Pakistan had a military operation in North Waziristan, which was very successful and pushed many terrorists out of Pakistan, but unfortunately, many of those terrorists then moved into Afghanistan. And it is one of the reasons there has been greater violence in Afghanistan, particularly in the North. One of the things that also changed is that the United States and NATO have drawn down the international troop presence, which has had an impact on both security and the economic situation in Afghanistan. A hopeful sign, of course, is the new unity government in power in Afghanistan, reform-oriented, interested in peace, but also politically and economically still getting its feet on the ground. They, that new government and efforts by Pakistan have brought much more focus on getting a political process on track that can hopefully contribute to a reduction in the levels of violence. And also, a key area of focus is on economic growth in both Pakistan and Afghanistan, which also will be critical for long-term peace. We were in Pakistan in July during the final stages of the, second, of the planning for the second round of talks in Murray, Pakistan, between the Afghan government officials and the Afghan Taliban. But on our second day in Kabul, we and the rest of the world learned that Mullah Omar, the leader of the Afghan Taliban, had in fact died two years earlier which subsequently derailed the second meeting of the Murray process that had been scheduled. There is an urgent need now to get the political process back on track so it can reduce the violence in Afghanistan. A further deterioration of security in Afghanistan and a worst case scenario return to the anarchic days of the early 1990s or the tyrannical rule of the Taliban in the late 1990s will not only be de devastating for Afghans, but highly destabilizing for Pakistan and the broader South and Central Asia region. There now seems to be a greater consensus than ever before within the region on the need for security and stability in Afghanistan. And there's an urgent need to build on this consensus to push an inclusive peace process forward. In this regard, I think we all should be encouraged by the joint statement that was re released by the Prime Minister and President Obama in the wake of their conversation yesterday. And let me just quote a passage from it, if I may. Both leaders expressed their commitment to advance an Afghan-owned and led peace and reconciliation process between the Afghan government and the Afghan Taliban, and called <clears throat> on Taliban leaders to enter into direct talks with Kabul and work toward a sustainable peace settlement. We know this is a priority for the Prime Minister, and we welcome his and everyone else's efforts to promote peace in this critically important region of the world. And now it is my honor and privilege to introduce the Prime Minister his, Ex His Excellency Mia Mohammad Nawaz Sharif is the current Prime Minister of Pakistan. His inauguration in June of 2013 followed elections in which for the first time a government selected through the ballot box completed its rule and was able to hand over power to another civilian government elected through the ballot box. Prime Minister Sharif became the first person in Pakistan's history to hold the, hold the office of Prime Minister three times, having previously served non-consecutive terms from 1990 to 1993 and 1997 to 1990. Prior to his first election as Prime Minister, he served as Chief Minister of Punjab, Pakistan's most populous province, from 1985 to 1990. Mr. Prime Minister, it is a pleasure to have you with us here again today. Please, the podium is here.
بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم پریزیڈنٹ یونائٹڈ اسٹیٹس انسٹیٹیوٹ آف پیس نینسی لن بوگ چیئرمین اسٹیو ہیڈلے ڈسٹنگش گیس لیڈیز اینڈ جینٹل مین اٹ از مائی پریولیج ٹو ایڈریس دس ڈسٹنگش گروپ آف اسکالرز پروفیشنلس media representatives and members of Washington's policy community for the second time in the past two years. I want to thank the U.S. Institute of Peace I would also like to commend the outstanding contribution made by the Institute to promote scholarship and understanding about issues concerning international <clears throat> peace and security. Ladies and gentlemen, Pakistan is an old and indispensable friend of the United States. Friends need to revive and renew their relationships from time to time. I am visiting Washington to reaffirm and reinforce our important relationship. Since I was here two years ago, Pakistan has witnessed several positive developments. Domestically, democracy has been strengthened, terrorism is being combated, the economy has been stabilized and is poised for rapid growth. Yet, we still face external challenges to pacify Afghanistan and normalize relations with India. Ladies and gentlemen, let me brief hi briefly highlight each of these developments. Let me turn first to our strengthened and resilient democracy. In 2013, Pakistan saw a landmark transition when power was transferred after the May 2013 elections from one elected government to another. For the first time, in the history of uh, Pakistan. In the following year, when political agitation was launched by one party, all the other parties came together in the parliament in defense of the democratic process. <clears throat> this, new, this now reflects a firm national consensus with an independent judiciary, a free media, and a vibrant civil society, democratic institutions and traditions are becoming stronger in Pakistan. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, the second area I want to highlight is counter-terrorism. When my government was elected, it faced a formidable internal security challenge. Pakistan had lost 50,000 civilians to terrorist attacks emanating from multiple sources and violence was on the rise. Two years later, we have turned the tide against terrorism in Pakistan. We made a strategic choice to eliminate all terrorist groups through a comprehensive strategy involving forceful law enforcement actions and targeted military operations. This is as, as much a moral obligation as a security imperative. We have done it in our own national interest, not at the behest of others. Our military operation, Zarbeyaz, launched in June 2014, the largest anywhere in the world, has produced remarkable results. Terrorist sanctuaries, command and control and infrastructure have been totally destroyed. Thousands have been killed or captured. The rest are on the run. As the operation goes into its final phase, their few remaining hideouts will be cleared. Simultaneously, through well-coordinated intelligence-based law enforcement 
operations across Pakistan, the government has launched a focused campaign against terrorist sleeper cells, their supporters, sympathizers, and financiers. Following the horrendous and cowardly attack on a school in Peshawar last December, the entire country united to fight the evil of terrorism. We devised a comprehensive national action plan to fight terrorism through a multi-pronged strategy, combining military action, law enforcement operations, choking terrorist financing, and countering the extremist narrative. Our strategy has produced impressive results. The past year has seen the lowest number of terrorist attacks and suicide bombings since 2007. This significant improvement in the security situation could not have been possible without the resolve of the people. Parliamentary consensus and the dedication and sacrifice of our security forces, all of who came together to counter and confront this menace. The bravery of 14-year-old Etazaz Hassan of Hangu, who sacrificed his life to save his fellow students and the extraordinary tenacity of Malala Yousafzai has inspired the entire nation to rise against this scourge. Hundreds of such stories of heroism have been written in blood and tears. And the blood that has been shed has only strengthened our national resolve to fight until the last terrorist is eliminated. We must acknowledge, however, that radicalization emerges from multiple sources. We need to address not only the symptoms of radicalization, but also its root causes, which are often to be found in political or social alienation and exclusion, as well as extreme poverty. Identifying terrorism with a specific culture or group is disingenuous. It serves to shift responsibility and not resolve the challenge of radicalization which so many societies face today. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> the third positive I now want to talk about is Pakistan's economy. <clears throat> As a result of uh, bold economic reforms, my government has achieved significant improvement in all major economic indicators. Pakistan's <clears throat> GDP growth rate has increased from an average of around 3% over the past seven years to 4.4%. Last year, it was 4.4% and is expected to be at least 5% this year. We have reduced the budget deficit and contained inflation to the lowest level in the past two decades by reducing wasteful expenditure. The Karachi Stock Exchange has performed better than most of the world's stock markets. Pakistan's economic upturn is now acknowledged worldwide. <clears throat> Bloomberg has, descri has described Pakistan as the best undiscovered frontier market. Morgan Stanley has predicted that the economic rise of Pakistan is only a matter of time. Both Moody and <clears throat> Standard & Poor have upgraded Pakistan's credit rating to positive. With a young and vibrant population of 200 million, a middle class larger than other South Asian countries, growing consumer demand, as well as a stable economy and improved security, Pakistan today offers enormous opportunities for profitable investment and trade. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the key pillars of my government's policy is to encourage regional integration and connectivity. This is where Pakistan and its neighbors have the biggest opportunity to reap the dividends of peace. The most promising element of this policy is the recently launched China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. This concept embraces a package of multiple infrastructure and development projects. The China-Pakistan Economic Corridor will not be confined to China and Pakistan. Both countries will welcome the participation of public and private companies from other countries, including the United States of America. Simultaneously, Pakistan is promoting other regional energy and infrastructure projects, 
including Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, gas pipeline project. Central Asia, South Asia, 1,000 electricity project. The Kuna power project and Turkham Jalalabad road project. Ladies and gentlemen, we recognize that economic growth will be meaningful and sustainable if accompanied by social and human development. My government will allocate larger resources to health, education, technology, and training to equip our people to fully participate and benefit from Pakistan's rapid growth. Recognizing the women, especially young girls, hold the key to reaping the demographic dividend, we have introduced numerous initiatives for enhanced economic participation and political empowerment of women and girls in Pakistan. We are committed to provide our women greater access to education, economic resources, skill development, and employment opportunities to enable them to rightfully become equal partners in our economic development. In this context, we welcome the Obama administration's initiative, Let Girls Learn, that will enhance cooperation in this important sector between the United States and Pakistan. We remain committed to providing all segments of society, in particular religious minorities, equal opportunities to benefit from the fruits of economic growth. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> a guiding precept of Pakistan's founder Qaeda Azam, Muhammad Ali Jannah, was peace within and peace without. My government foreign policy is guided by the principles peace for development and peaceful neighborhood. Peace with our neighbors will enhance our domestic security and economic growth and development. One of the first steps that I took after assuming office was to send a message of peace and cooperation to all our immediate neighbors, including Afghanistan and India. More recently, the security environment in Afghanistan has deteriorated. Pakistan condemns all terrorist violence in Afghanistan. There are two paths to peace in Afghanistan. One, military victory over insurgents or a negotiated peace and national reconciliation. Over the past 14 years, a military solution has been elusive. We believe that it is unlikely to be achieved in the future. Thus, achieving peace through negotiations is the best option. Pakistan undertook at present, at President Ghani's behest, to facilitate a dialogue between Kabul and the tehreek e taliban Afghanistan. A first round of intra-Afghan talks was held in Murray, as mentioned by uh, Steve uh, Headley. A first round of uh, uh, intra-Afghan talks was held in Murray. Both sides characterized this round as encouraging. A second session was set for 31st July, a few days before untimely revelations about the death of Mullah Omar, the leader of the Afghan Taliban, produced predictable consequences. Without the authority of their leader to engage in the dialogue, the Taliban broke off the talks. In their su succession struggle, their default option was to revert to a fighting mode. Pakistan has no reason to want any violence in Afghanistan. The attacks on the Afghan government, and indeed on Pakistan, emanate from the vast areas in Afghanistan, now under Taliban control. Pakistan's priority is to defeat the TTP, which has also found bases on Afghan territory. Peace within Afghanistan will enable Pakistan to eliminate the TTP threat. I have again conveyed to President Ashraf Ghani that if he desires, we are prepared to assist in reviving the talks between Kabul and Afghan Taliban. But we cannot bring them to the table and be asked to kill them at the same time. Ladies and gentlemen, I have made sincere efforts to improve relations with India. I was one of the first to congratulate Prime Minister Modi 
on his electoral victory in May 2014. I accepted his invitation to attend his swearing-in ceremony. However, the positive momentum generated by that meeting was halted when New Delhi cancelled the Foreign Secretary-level talks on a flimsy excuse. I met Mr. Modi again in Ufa, Russia. Again, the National Security Advisors meeting was scuttled by India to limit the talks to one issue and to dictate the program of our National Security Advisor in New Delhi. The cancellation of the NSA level talks has been followed by increased ceasefire violations by India across the line of control in Kashmir and the working boundary. <clears throat> and a stream of hostile statements by the Indian political and military leadership. Meanwhile, anti-Pakistan actions by Hindu extremists are exacerbating the present tensions in our region. In my address to the United Nations General Assembly last month, I proposed a new peace initiative comprising four specific and feasible steps that could serve as the basis for progress towards normalization. Unfortunately, India's response was not positive. While refusing dialogue, India is engaged in a major arms buildup, regrettably, with the active assistance of several powers. It has adopted dangerous military doctrines. This will compel Pakistan to take several countermeasures to preserve credible deterrence. A normal and stable relationship between Pakistan and India can be built by adherence to the principles of the UN Charter, especially the principle of sovereignty, equality of states and non-interference in their internal affairs and the right of peoples to self-determination. There is no alternative for the two countries but to resume a comprehensive dialogue to resolve all outstanding issues, including the core issue of Jammu and Kashmir. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> Pakistan is fully committed to the objectives of non-proliferation and disarmament. Over the years, Pakistan has adopted a number of national measures to strengthen export controls and security, which are consistent with the best international standards. Pakistan is also participating in global efforts to prevent and combat proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. We have also contributed constructively to the Nuclear Security Summit process, President Obama, Obama's laudable initiative. To fulfill its vast energy needs, Pakistan will install several nuclear, civil nuclear power plants under IAEA safeguards. We look forward to international cooperation in this context. And as a responsible nuclear power and one, of, uh, and one with the expertise manpower and infrastructure to produce civil nuclear energy, it would be mutually beneficial for Pakistan to be accepted as a member of the nuclear suppliers group and other export control regimes. Ladies and gentlemen, it is significant that on all the priority issues I have mentioned, America's objectives are convergent with Pakistan's. Our extensive cooperation on counterterrorism can be intensified and improved, and improved, especially by promoting mutual trust and confidence. The US remains our biggest uh, single trading partner. Greater trade access would be crucial in propelling growth and employment in Pakistan. And of greater significance for Pakistan would be US investments in various sectors of our economy and participation in our planned infrastructure development, especially the connectivity projects. On Afghanistan, difficult yet essential decisions are required in Kabul. Islamabad and Washington to find the best way to end violence and restore peace. Obviously, the Pakistan-India relationship poses the most difficult and urgent challenge. I believe a close review of some of the existing assumptions and analysis and greater attention to Pakistan's views and interests would be useful in enabling 
Washington to play a constructive role in averting the ever-present danger of escalation and promoting stability in South Asia. A close and enduring partnership between Pakistan and the United States is, we believe, a strategic imperative for achieving lasting peace and stability in our region and beyond. This beautiful capital signifies in more ways than one the glorious struggles of the past in pursuit of liberty and freedom and the aspirations of a better future shared by both of our great nations. Together, we should work as equal partners towards these shared goals. I thank you. Prime Minister, I want to really express our appreciation once again for your joining us here today. Uh, underscore, um, I believe, our joint commitment to constructive dialogue uh, and the kind of dialogue that can lead to mutual understanding as opposed to uh, outbursts that we regret. And I'd like to present you with a small token of uh, appreciation for your visit today and a Thank memento you. of your visit to uh, United States Institute of Peace. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.